So welcome back. In the previous lecture, we have began uh, defining what is the central problem in quantum chemistry, which is the so-called electronic problem. And just to summarize the essence of that lecture is that in order to understand the dynamics of a biomolecule, what we actually need to do in practice is to consider, first consider a configuration in which the nuclei are all fixed at given positions. and assume that they are fixed at this position and solve a Schrodinger equation for the electrons at fixed nuclear positions where these are the Ri of the electrons. The solution of the Schrodinger equation is called the solution of the electronic problem. And more specifically, what we are interested in is the ground state. If you look at the ground state of this system, of the electronic system, Then what we obtain is an energy that depends on the set of nuclear coordinates. And then if you want to treat the nuclei as classical, then we can take the gradient of this energy and interpret it as the force acting on the kth particle. So what this gradient really means is the, for instance, this is the X component of the gradient with respect to the X co coordinate of the kth particle. Okay, so really what we want to do is to be able to solve a, a problem of ground state energy of many electrons in the field produced by themselves and by a set of nuclei at fixed position. And we need to repeat that in principle for all the positions where the nuclei can be found or just enough positions so that you can sort of invent a fitting formula that reproduces the entire possibility of nuclear configurations. Now, clearly electrons are quantum mechanical particles. So really the electronic problem <coughs> is in fact a quantum many body problem. Okay, and since electrons are fermions, are spin one half particles, we need to satisfy this problem to solve for a wave functions that is a function of all the um, electronic positions and a parametric function, remember, of all the Qs, which I will collectively represent as a capital Q. These are the nuclear positions. But this wave function must be anti-symmetric with respect to exchange of any pairs of electrons because that was the spin statistic theorem says, right? Electrons are fermion. And if you go back in the course when we discussed the spin statistic connection, we have learned that Fermionic wave functions are anti-symmetric under exchange of identical particles. So in particular, say if I take, uh, I don't know, particle one, let, let's, let's do, let be, let's, let's, let's remind ourselves what this means. Suppose I have many, many electrons and for instance, I pick up the eth electron and the jth electron, and then n, r, n. Then of course there's the dependence on all other coordinates. Well, if I switch the eth and the jth particle, I must get pick up a minus sign. See what I've done at the I position I have put 
the jth electron and the jth positions I put the ith electron. So. so graphically, basically what's going on here is that I have an electron, say I have a set of nuclei, have a bunch of electrons. I'm not gonna count exactly how many they are. Just gonna sketch a few points here and say, suppose I'm gonna label them. One, two, three, four. This is the eth and this is the jth. So now if I'm considering an, an virtually identical system in which I have put the jth particle where before there was an eth particle, and the eth particle where before it was the j particle. So I have done this inversion or permutation. Well, the wave function for this new configuration must be the same as the previous wave function with a negative sign. So this is a fundamental request that follows from the sky, meaning it's either something you can demonstrate from experiment and that's how people initially discovered it. And later on, they were able to demonstrate that this is actually the result rather than just falling from the sky from experiment. This is in fact, the result of uh, a theorem that can, can be demonstrated from relativistic quantum mechanics. So the question is, how can we solve for the Schrodinger equation in this problem. And this is in fact a very complicated problem. And in order to do that, in order to do that, we need to take this stepwise. We will have to introduce approximations. But before we go into that, let's consider the simplest possible problem. So let's do some preparatory pre Preparatory work. So let's take the electronic problem aside for a moment, leave it for later, and first let's look at a simpler, much, much simpler problem. And this problem is in fact, let's consider the wave function on an identical boson in a box. And I would say non-interactive. So what is this problem? This problem is a problem in which I take a square web, for instance, in two dimensions for simplicity. And that's but let us assume it's really square for sake of simplicity. It could be rectangular. And in fact, it looks rectangular from this drawing. Now it's not square. And in this, I imagine that the potential is infinite everywhere outside the box. And we assume that the particle inside the box do not experience any mutual interaction. So particle I does not interact with particle J, but only interacts with the walls. Is this realistic? Who cares for the moment? If the system is sufficient, sufficiently dilute, meaning that there are very few particles in the box, then the chances that they get close enough to interact may be small enough, and we can suppose that this is a decent approximation. Now, if this is the case, then my Hamiltonian here would be simply a collection of n free particle Hamiltonian, and then I will pose the boundary conditions of each of them. Now, if you remember, if you go back quite a few lectures by now to the beginning of the course, then you realize that we discussed at the beginning of the course how, in fact, when you have a sum, a Hamiltonian consisting of sum of independent terms, and by independent, I mean that each of these derivatives contains, each of these terms contains derivative with respect to different variables. So there's nothing that contains simultaneously two variables. 
We have a collection of terms. Each one acts on a single variable. Let's be more specific. This is the Laplacian for particle one, which is this. This is particle two and same structure, but now I'm differentiating with respect to the X coordinate of particle two and so on and so forth. And as you can see, there's nothing about particle two in this term of, that concerns only particle one, and there's nothing about particle one in this term. So really the Hamiltonian is, an, is a set of terms. Each one acts on a subset of variables. Whenever <laughs> this is the case, Whenever this is the case, if you remember, then the wave function, the solution of the problem, before we were even beginning to worry about symmetries, was assumed to be a product of solutions of single particles. Wave function. And then it can be, in principle, they can be different because, you know, one can be in a ground state and the other one can be in the excited state. And then you get, you know, all sorts of excitations. Now, obviously, on top of that, you need to worry about this system being symmetric under exchange of particles if these particles are actually boson, like in this case. Now, clearly, if this is a wave function with all identical particles, for simplicity, then this is clearly symmetric under exchange because if I exchange particle two with particle five or particle three, say, I put particle three now, I focus on just the pair two, three, for instance, and so this is the wave function R1. R2, R3, blah, 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 until Rn. And clearly, if I now exchange two with three, I will get another wave function. But here I will have R3. Oh yeah, there's a problem with, okay. Three, and here I will have R one, and then five R N. Now, this is a product so I can actually, this is the wave function which I've inverted R3. And R2, right? Just as an example. And now clearly, since I can always switch, swap the order of a product in a normal function, then I, I can always say that this is equal to phi of R2, phi of R3, simply because this is equal to phi of R3, phi of R2 for the properties of trivial multiplication. And therefore I have that the function is indeed symmetric under the exchange of any identical particle. So the simplest way to, to solve a problem for a simple possible quantum many problem, a free gas of boson, is simply solve one one body problem, one particle in the box, and then multiply together the same wave function for all particles. That's a fairly good base state, symmetric state. If some of the particles are in the excited state, you get an excited state wave function, then of course you have to worry to, but to build combinations to ensure that the total wave function is still symmetric. But this is the simplest way to build the symmetric wave functions for your post. So 
the essence of this discussion is product of single particle function works because they satisfy the symmetry and because this is the, the Hamiltonian that we started off with was a sum of single particle Hamiltonian. So the single particle Hamiltonian was negative h bar square over 2m gradient with respect, Laplacian with respect to the eighth particle. Cool. Now, whenever I have interactions, however, between particles, I add now an interaction. The interaction depends by definition on more than one particle position. So clearly, whenever I introduce interaction between particles, the Hamiltonian is no longer simply the sum of independent Hamiltonians. And if it's no longer the sum of independent Hamiltonian, then clearly the wave function will no longer be a product of single particle wave functions, even for boson. So here we immediately see we have to face two problems. Problem number one, how do we go from a free theory to an interacting theory? How do we solve for a wave function for a problem that is not as trivial as a free particle in a box? And problem number two, what's the structure of the wave function for boson? And in the future, since we want to solve the electronic problem, really the question we need to solve is, what's the structure of the wave functions for fermions? Already? Good. That's, that's basically, that's basically the, the big charge. In order to, to solve this problem, I want to introduce one additional layer of approximation. Let's still remain in the bosonic context. Let's still consider the bosonic quantum manipulative problem. Let's not worry yet about fermions in a box. Now, remember, whenever I have a, a bunch of particles that interact with each other, the wave function we just finished saying doesn't simply factorize in the product of wave function. Why? Because you see, they, these particles, they interact one with another, right? So the probability of finding this particle one in this point depends also on the position, say, of particle five, because if particle five gets closer to particle one, and maybe she, the, this particle is emitting a repulsive force, particle one maybe doesn't want to be so close. The simple possible case is one in which this particle had a final radius of interaction, say. You can think about something that resembles some by and then some billiard balls, the one that you play billiard with. If particle five gets to overlap with particle one, then obviously the probability of finding particle one and particle five on the same spot in the presence of this strong repulsive short distance is zero. So it is clearly not an independent particle. This is what it typically uh, in, in the physics jargon is called a dynamical correlation. Okay. However, we now take an approximation and says, okay, suppose I want to solve for the motion of all these particles. But there are many particles here. And they all move around because they have a wave function, they're all delocalized. So rather than a point here, I should really think about, oops, 
sorry. So really think about that each particle has a wave function. This is way too, way too. simply doesn't seem to be working, okay, fine. So, you know, I have this particle, this particle, this particle. Suppose we are interested in particularly one particle, in which I draw like this. Now, clearly the approximation that I'm making is that this particle is not really feeling, so rather than considering the, the correlation of this particle with all the others individually, all the possible pairs, we take the assumption that you know, since there are many particles around, my particle that I'm focusing on experiencing, experiences like a cloud of all other particles, like a mean field of all other particles. So in particular, suppose if I think about the electrons for a moment, it's like saying that I have my electron here that in principle is an atom with many electrons and it can feel the Coulombic repulsion from all the electrons around. Or I can say, okay, let's take approximation that all the other electrons, all the other electrons in the atom collectively generate a charge density, a negative charge density. And my electron, since they move very fast, right, they have a wave function. And, and basically my electron experiences this mean cloud of electrons. I want to make an analogy that will clarify this concept of mean field. So what you see in this picture is a, is a piece of art by Atta Kim. Atta Kim is a photographer, I think from Japan, I'm not sure, whose uh, specialty is to take long exposure photographs. So now the, the coloring is not perfect, but basically this is a Times Square, New York. And these are two avenues that cross precisely at Times Square. So I think the one is, one I'm quite sure is Broadway going down. The other one should be, I guess it's, is it Sixth Avenue? I don't remember, but it doesn't really matter. I haven't been in New York for quite some time now. You see these yellow stripes here? These are taxis. So what this picture says is that, you know, if you're a, you know, a pedestrian in center, in, 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 in Times Square, your probability of hitting a taxi here in the central region of this walkway is very low. And there's a high taxi density at these tribes. So for your safety, I would, you know, rather than, you know, there's clearly a repulsive interaction between men and taxis. And you don't want to experience that interaction because it's called being hit by a taxi. That's what you want to avoid. Now, what this picture is telling me is that everything goes with, as if, if I look at the problem with long resolution time, as there is a high taxi density here and here. That's where you get the largest chance of interacting with the taxi. So there's a repulsive taxi interaction here and here a man. So if you walk here, you're free from that interaction. You walk along the driveway and avoid the two street, the two avenues here. You're away from the point where the taxis are. So this is called performing a mean field approximation you're replacing the very position of the taxis with a mean density produced by many taxis being around. Okay? So we want to do the same. So our original problem, if I have to say pairwise inter pair pair interaction, for boson or fermions, doesn't matter. My original Hamiltonian is a sum of kinetic energies for each of the particles, plus a potential that mixes all the coordinates, right? 
and I make the approximation is that each particle experiences an interaction that depends only on its own position with a mean field produced by all the others. Now, if I do this approximation, then again, my Hamiltonian becomes once again, a sum of single particle Hamiltonian with the only difference that these are no longer free particle Hamiltonian, they are interacting Hamiltonian because they depend on a mean field. For example, we can take a very, 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 very phenomenological approach and say, okay, I have my particles. The particles stay together because they interact. Maybe they have some traction. Let's suppose I have n bosons and now let's suppose they attract each other so they can tend to form a bound state. And of course, suppose that there is pairwise interaction between all of them, but I can replace these and say, okay, each of them, the result of all this pairwise interaction is that of forming a collecting basin where, you know, three dimensional basin, I'm gonna draw it. Okay, I'm very bad at drawing, but basin, I'm gonna attempt drawing this. So the particle experiences a basin potential that is the result of having every particle interacting attractively with the other and everybody is liking to stay together. Is, the, is this an exact approach? No, it's not. It's admittedly approximated. But we shall see later that this approximation will take a long way. And then I believe to solve problems that we will not be able to solve otherwise. Uh, so yes, this is the mean field approximation. So if you have a mean field problem, if you have, if you can evaluate this boson, this mean field, or if you can model it, this is the mean field potential. Then instead of solving an N body problem, you can solve N one body problems. Because you see, once you have an Hamiltonian in this form, all you need to do is to solve the single Schrodinger equation for this Hamiltonian. And then you build your wave function for boson by a product of single particle wave functions. And the corresponding energy will be the sum of single particle energies. And you will be satisfying Schrodinger equation or the approximation to the Schrodinger equation that you decided to have and the bows of symmetry. That's, that's the essence of the so-called mean field approximation, which is the starting point for most, it's so to say the, the starting point for quantum antibody problem solutions. Along the decades, people have invented more sophisticated wave and more elaborated waves to approximate the solution of the Schrodinger equation. But it's always a good start to start with the mean field just to have a general idea of what the solution should more or less be. Because the, the essence of this discussion is that the complicacy in going from a, this level approximation to the next level approximation, which where you start taking into account of correlations in some other approximate way is huge. So really it is uh, quite significant to start with such a very bold, but very tractable approximation. So the real question is, can we use the same mean field approach to describe fermions or to solve 
for fermion many body problems. Can we do that? That's the question. There is one extra layer of difficulty we need to have face if we want to apply this mean field idea to the fermion many body problem. And it's the fact that the wave function for fermion is anti-symmetric. So simply an ansatz in which I take a product of single particle wave function and I use it to reduce the many body problem to n single particle one body problem doesn't work because I cannot simply do this. Why? Because this is not fulfilling Fermi sim anti symmetry between exchange of identical particle. So, can you generalize this simple solution, the simple product of? independent particle wave function to the electron case. How do we build a wave functions of the different electrons? That is number one, product single particle wave functions and number two, anti-symmetric with respect to the exchange of any pairs of particles. Now, this is where the concept of spin comes back into play. Because in the simplest possible case, let's consider, to see, to see how we can do that, let's, and how spin enters in the game, let's start by looking at the simplest case. The case, the simplest case is one in which I have only two electrons. And of course, my electrons can be in spin up or spin down states. Or they could be in excited states as well, but let's not worry about the fact of being in excited states. Let's suppose we're only interested in you know, ground state wave functions. Now, if I have two particles, I can build the following combination. My total wave function, which is a function of the position and the spin of the first particle and the position and the spin of the second particle can be built in the following way. Look, spin up R1, spin down R2, negative, spin down R1, spin up R2. Look at this. This is a perfect combination if you look at it, because if I just flip R and two, so if I look at the uh, wave function psi R2, S2, R1, S1, I switch, I swap my two particles, then it's clearly, all I get is the same structure up to a sign. So I will get exactly the same wave function with a negative sign. So the, the structure of the wave function that generalizes the simple product that we use for bosons to fermions, or better, to two fermions, is the one we just wrote down, the anti-symmetric combination. So that's great. That's, 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 uh, that's, uh, that's already something. We can solve it for two particles. And and I want to emphasize that there's a minimal, irreducible degree of complexity, which arises from the fact that we're dealing with spin. And instead of considering two different wave functions now, one for spin up and one for spin down. Remember before we had only, we could look at the ground state and have all the particles in the ground state, that right? There's symmetric combinations of particles of bosons all in the ground state. That's what is called the bosons the condensate. And all the particles in the system are down to the ground state. But we know from our previous uh, discussions that fermions cannot collapse all to the ground state because they would, they would violate 
out his exclusion principle, which is in turn a consequence of the anti-symmetry of David function. So in order to ensure the anti-symmetry of David function, we had to take into account for the spin. And basically, if you remember, a fermion is described basically by a doublet of wave function, one for the spin up and one for the spin down. This is called the spinner. And that's the minimal complicancy coming at us here. So we have two wave functions. Well, then at least we have solved the problems for two. But now really the question is, there's much more than two electrons in the electronic problem in chemistry. How do we solve for an N body problem? How do we go from two to N? How can we go from two to N? Well, in order to do that, we look at the general, let's, let's re, the idea is to rewrite the solution we have done in a slightly more general way. So basically what we did for building our function, if you think about it, we consider two wave functions. Instead of call it phi up and phi down, let me call it phi one and phi two. The important thing is that they must be different because remember, this is a, we, are, you know, we need two wave functions because we want two particles never being able to have exactly all the quantum numbers to be exactly in the same quantum states. That's the reason we want at least two wave functions. And so we can look at this as R1, phi one at R2, phi two at R, one and phi two at R2. Now in this case, for us in the previous choice, phi one was the spin up wave function and phi two was the spin down wave function. But let's be more general, consider one and two. And then if you take one over root of two factorial, then we have exactly the structure that we had before, because if you evaluate explicitly this determinant, this is gonna be, phi one R one, phi two R two negative, phi one R two, phi two R one. And now if I replace one with spin up and two with spin down, I get the anti-symmetric combination that I referred to before. So, but now you see, if you rewrite this anti-symmetric combination as a determinant, you've done nothing because I just rewritten the same thing. Two by two determinants are trivial. But now I can exploit the property that determinants are always anti-symmetric for exchange of two rows of two columns, right? Sorry to, to, uh, to elements in the matrix. So we are then led to the following educated guess. Well, maybe this is happening also for n greater than two, for instance, n equal three, four, five. And so we are led to postulate the following structure. The wave function for n body problem is one over root of n factorial because there are n factorial terms that make up a determinant of the determinant built by the following structure. One, I need this time n wave functions. Now to fulfill the Pauli principle, I need n different states. So for instance, one can be, you know, phi one, can be ground state up, phi two can be ground state down. Then I need the third one, phi three can be first excited state up and phi four can be first excited state down and so on and so forth until I have n different wave functions. And once I have n different wave function, I can build a determinant and be guaranteed that the determinant would be a product 
of single particle wave function, but with signs that ensure that the overall system is anti-symmetric under exchange of identity particles. Now this mathematical object here is called the Slater determinant. Now, I strongly encourage you to look at, you know, so actually let's, let's apply this for three particles. Let's suppose there are three electrons now in my system. And, and these three electrons experience a mean field, which is the effect of the interaction of all the other three, and maybe possibly some external confining magnetic trap. So I model all these physics with a Hamiltonian that is single particle Hamiltonian. Is it true? Is it a bad model? I don't care. It's an exercise. So I'm postulating here my Hamiltonian to be sum over I for one to three kinetic energy plus a confining potential, and I assume that all the particles are in the same confining potential, and maybe V of R is, I don't know, some harmonic parabolic potential, right? Now we know that we can think about so, so, so there is a ground state and there's N L state and there are P states, this is a three dimensional state. So let's suppose the ground state for this system will be, oops, sorry. Remember, this is a three dimensional problem. I should go into central, central core, polar coordinate and then distinguish between I then I will get a radio wave function for each of the electric for the, each of the single particle wave functions. Okay, I'm messing up. Let me, I'm skipping too many points. Let me just do it. So, so how does the solution work for this problem? I need to write down, I need to write down Schrodinger equation. And I need to write down a guess for the wave function. The wave function will have to be a product of independent particle systems, the independent particle wave function, because the Hamiltonian is separable in independent particle sum or components, but it must be anti-symmetric. So what I do, I build a Slater determinant with three particles. So what do I do? To do that, I compute the determinant and I, you know, the lowest energy would be two electrons in the ground state and one electron in the first excited state. Maybe the, this first excited state will be an S wave. Maybe it will be a P wave. Depends on the details of my harmonic potential. Certainly the ground state is gonna be an S state. Maybe this is a P wave. Maybe it's an S state. I don't know. Uh, I don't care at this level. I'll call it phi one and phi two, right? whatever it is. So what I will be writing is phi one. So ground state, let's call phi zero, the ground state spin up of particle one. Ground state spin down of particle one. And first excited state of say particle one spin up, why not? Could be also spin down, but I assume that the third one is here. Spin up. Then I have ground state spin up of particle two and ground state spin up of particle three. And then I have ground state spin down of particle two, ground state spin down of particle three. And then I have Ground at first excited state spin up of particle two, first excited state spin up of particle three. Now you see this wave function is now very 
this, this later determinant is very complicated. And I have one over n factorial, in this case is three factorial, this root over six. Now you really have to fight hard to build this combination because you would have to write, I'm gonna write just the first few terms. Ground state, phi one, R one, multiplying by ground state, phi down, R two, ground state, first excited state, spin up, R three, negative, ground state, spin down, R three, first excited state, spin up, R two, and that's only concerning this first combination, this and this determinant. And then I have three more terms down here. I would build a huge wave function, but this wave function would be a linear combination of products of three single particle states. Each three single particle state is a solution of a simple problem in the form ground state or first excited state of the harmonic potential in 3D. So in particular, I will have that ground state spin up plus one half m omega square r square ground state spin up would be my E zero ground state spin up. And I will have the same for spin down. And then I will have a slightly different energy for the first excited state. This would be first excited state, spin up one. So provided I can solve for the one particle Schrodinger equation in my system, I can build an anti-symmetric combination of particles. So that's how you build uh, a simple mean field approach to multiparticle fermions. So what I recommend you to familiarize with this and write down explicitly the uh, Slater determinants for three fermions. And maybe in the discussion sessions, either this Wednesday or, or in the future, we're gonna go over these concepts again try to see whether we can familiarize with them a little bit more. They are admittedly not the simplest. It will take some time to do that, okay? Okay, thank you very much. And I'll talk to you soon.